Um, Taner Akcham is our guest today on CivilNet, and it's a pleasure, a privilege, an honor to talk to Taner on any occasion, uh, let alone on this one. Uh, Taner Akcham had brought suit to the European Court of Human Rights, um, and the European Court of Human Rights sided with Professor Taner Akcham, uh, saying that, in fact, uh, his freedom of speech was abrogated by Article 301. Is that a fair summary, Taner, of what the court decided? Yes, it is true. Uh, on two instances, one is the uh, court decided uh, that I am a victim of the 301. I mean, uh, the Turkish 301 violates uh, the European Human Rights uh, Convention. And the other important part is that uh, court asked Turkey to change the law because uh, of the definition of Turkishness. It is very vague. So it is an important step in that regard. I want to talk about the definition of Turkishness. I'm afraid that may take a few days, but it's something that has to be discussed in the context of, of legal jargon. How can one legally define Turkishness? It is very problematic and this is the actually uh, problem today. Uh, in 2008, they made a change in the law. Actually, they amended the law and they took out the Turkishness and they replaced it with Turkish uh, government, Turkish state institutions and so on. Even in the new definition, it is not very clear uh, and there are public prosecutors still wants to interpret these uh, Turkish or uh, uh, insult of Turkish state institutions in a way that restrict the freedom of speech. This is the important part. Let's let's get real. The Article 301 itself is something that is very difficult to understand, and with all of the swipes that are being taken at that article and all of the efforts to, you know, reformulate it and re re reformulate it, is there any chance that that's going to be scrapped anytime soon? Uh, if we trust Turkish government, they officially declared that they are going through the all laws and regulation, existing law and regulation, and during this winter they will change most of them, which are restricting the freedom of speech, uh, because they are preparing now a new constitution, as you may know, and uh, this will be done until May, and during this period they are also planning to rescind or totally change, amended the existing laws which restricted freedom of speech, but we have to wait and see. This is the uh, Turkish reality we always wait and try to see, and sometimes we don't see what we want. Yeah, the, the hopeful part of all of us says, let's hope they use this opportunity to really scrap something that is, you know, internationally and nationally, I suspect, insulting. On the other hand, who was it that said the Turks don't miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity? So they may find another way to work this law into the new constitution. I mean, the main problem is only not the laws. We have to uh, accept this. Even you put the most modern, most progressive law in there, there will be enough public prosecutors because uh, to try the individual who wants to express their uh, thoughts. The major problem is also the mentality. This is like the post-war uh, period in Nazi Germany. There were a lot of Nazi uh, judges in the justice system and they interpreted according to their uh, ideological can you imagine within one year, for example, thousand public, uh, thousand cases were filed by the justice ministry and justice ministry allowed only seven, seven, 77 or something like that of them. I mean, we have a system and judges and uh, public prosecutors that really educated and trained in a way that they don't have the human being in their center. For them, there is only one thing state and interest of the state, and they interpret this state and interest of the state just against the human rights and the freedom of thought. This is the major problem in Turkey, not the law alone. It is the mentality that we have there as a problem. And, and that mentality uses these judicial processes in order to intimidate and to try to silence those who are not speaking in the interests of the state, as you say. 
Exactly. It is the problem that what we are facing now in Turkey. Um, as a Turkish historian um, and as the holder of the Kalustian Mugar Chair at Clark University in Massachusetts, the Mugar, Kalustian Mugar Chair of Modern Armenian History and Armenian Genocide, that's quite a title and a burden. Um, how do you think the European Court of Human Rights decision impacts the course of Turkish history, Armenian history, Armenian-Turkish relations? Or is this just a, a little drop still? No, legally it's binding. This is the important part. Turkey is already signed the agreement uh, of the European Human Rights Court, so the court's decision has the superseding character and it is uh, over than Turkish law. So if Turkey wants to continue, which they express this desire several times, want to be a member of European Union and uh, stay in touch and uh, ties with European Union, they have to change this law according to European Human Rights Court's decision. They don't have any other choice. So legally, my court case has a binding character and an example for the similar court cases. For example, now uh, I give an example. Everybody, I think, knows Raghup Zarakolu. Raghup Zarakolu was sentenced in 2008 for using the term genocide in one of his books. Uh, I mean, uh, it was written by an Armenian in London and uh, court could not find this Armenian author and then they sentenced Raghup Zarakolu instead. So my court case now, my this European court decision has a direct impact on Raghup's decision. Raghup's decision must be uh, fall down. So in that sense, legally, it has a direct impact in certain court cases. But regarding the other court cases, there are a lot of other court cases from 301. For example, insulting the Turkish prime minister or in insulting other Turkish government institution, which has nothing to do with 1915. In that cases, it is the interpretation of the judges, of course. But at least uh, the court decision overall has a character that supersedes the Turkish law, so the Turkish government must change the law. There is no other way. You know, we interviewed Raghip Zaraoğlu just a few days before he was arrested, and, uh, and it was, uh, in fact, on the occasion of your court verdict, so it was ironic that, you know, we celebrated and appreciated that and at the same time, now we find that Raghup is again behind bars. Um, if you want to say anything about that, do I do have one last question for you. Uh, Raghup's case is a scandal, actually. Uh, maybe uh, I have to repeat, uh, it is, of course, the right of Turkish government uh, legally to go after any illegal organization in Turkey. Nobody can... Uh, blame or attack or criticize a government if a government arrests some Ill members of an illegal organization. You can uh, argue whether it is politically a smart move or not, but at the end, this is the within the jurisdiction and legal right of a, a state. But in case of Raghup and Busra Esh Eshranli, we know that they really interpret this action in a very loose way. Raghup and Bushra, they both has nothing to do with the organization KKJ, this illegal organization, and they only uh, gave some lectures in one of the schools of a legal party. And this is in that sense a scandal and a direct attack against freedom of speech in Turkey. Oh, this is becoming a very uh emotional and, and tearing sort of situation this last several months have brought all these uh, both heartwarming uh, events, decisions, such as the one in your case, and at the same time the situation with Raghup, his son, and the others. Uh, you're a historian. I don't need to remind you that history takes time. Today, ironically, uh, is the anniversary of the day when historian Bernard Lewis uh, in uh, 1993 wrote the article in Le Monde, remember, where he said genocide is the Armenian point of view. Yes, I know, I remember. 
Michael appeared today, and two years later, he, the French court said, too bad, it is genocide. You don't have the right to say that. I know. Fifteen years later, we're still here. Uh, in Turkey, we're still there. There are important steps. We have to see that also. Uh, to organize, for example, conferences on Armenian genocide is almost now a daily event in Turkey. Recently, a couple uh, days ago, in Diyarbakir, there was a major conference and there were a lot of scholars, Armenian scholars from uh, diaspora, from United States, from Europe, and they presented presented papers, and this is now every day's, uh, part of every day's discourse in Turkey. There is some changes. The problem, I think, is not only the legal restrictions that we are facing. The, for me, the basic hindrance or basic obstacle that we have, as the, the Arbaker conference shows, and I, as I listened from a lot of my friends, the lack of knowledge in Turkish society. Uh, basically, what we need to work on and continue work very hard is to enlighten Turkish people. One of the observers in the Arbakir conference uh, told me a very interesting observation. He said that uh, even though the Kurds and Turks who were in this conference and uh, all open-minded individuals, they were shocked with the information that they heard from some Armenian colleagues from uh, on the genocide and on certain events around, surrounding 1915. Even these progressive individuals were shocked about the events and about the information that they, they learned. Really, we have to take very seriously, 90 years or 100 years almost changed the Turkish mentality a lot and there had been a very continuous organized state-sponsored education and we really need to educate and to enlighten Turkish public opinion. This is my appeal, this is my uh, really call to a lot of Armenian people. Really they should go and talk with Turkish people. This is what we need. We need a change from the bottom up. This is what I want to say. Thank you. Coming from you, that means a lot because that is what you have turned into both your professional and personal mission. Thank you, Taner Akcam, for this interview, for the work that you do, and we hope we'll continue to speak on CivilNet. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Taner Akcam, Kalustian Mugar, Professor of Modern Armenian History and Armenian Genocide at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, a historian, a Turkish historian, who has for the last 20 years spoken about and written about the Armenian Genocide in the context of Turkish history and Turkish historiography. Mm -hmm.